Back when I was in school, I majored in history. And one of the big frustrations about majoring in history was that you felt you could never really get back to see what it was really like back in the days that you were studying about. Studying about the 13th century, what was it really like? Think about all the generalizations they made about 13th century culture in Europe. And you know, had lived through the 20th and into the 21st centuries, what kind of generalizations would really do justice to the reality of that kind of experience? How can you sum up a century in a sentence or two? And the more you read the stories that history is, the more you got the sense that it could never take you back there. It's good to reflect on this, because look at how we live our lives. We tend to live in the narratives that we make about our lives, what happened in the past, what we would like to see happen in the future, what's the basic storyline, looking for development, looking for closure. How much does that storyline really have to do with reality? How much does it actually stand in the way of our seeing reality? Think about that, especially as you meditate. There are ways of telling the story of your life that help you into the meditation. As you look at the suffering you've had in the past and the need to do something about it and the recognition that a lot of that suffering was because of your own unskillful habits. And that your skillful habits need some work. That kind of story helps bring you into the meditation. But there are a lot of other stories that pull you away. You've got to watch out for those. Because what they do is they make you impatient, they make you less observant about what's actually going on. You sit here working with your breath. Maybe in the back of the mind there's the thought, let's just get over this over and done with so we can move on to the next stages, which are a lot more interesting. So you're not really looking at your breath, you're looking at your plans for the next stage. Or thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen the next day. So again, instead of really looking at the breath, looking at the present moment, you're looking at your thoughts about what's going to happen in the future. Or how much longer you're going to have to work with this before you start seeing results. That's another way of getting the story and putting it in the way of actually seeing what's happening right here and now. So when you see those thoughts arising, learn how to put them away. This is hard because a lot of our sense of who we are is in the story. This is one area where the, the teaching on not-self is a useful teaching, to see how artificial and made up our sense of who we are is, just like the storyline is artificial and made up. And it gets in the way of the work we need to do in the present moment. People sometimes believe that the whole purpose of the meditation is to get into the present moment and just stay there. But the Buddha never talked like that. There's always there's work to be done in the present moment. That's why you get here. You want to settle down and understand your intentions acting here in the present moment. Because that's where you can the only place you can really observe your intentions. Because if there's going to be any greed or anger or delusion in the intention, you're going to see it only in the present moment. After it's passed, that intention is just a memory. And you know how memory tends to color things, depending on what you want to see, how it fits into a narrative, either a negative narrative about yourself or a good narrative about yourself, but still it's just a narrative. There's no guarantee that you're going to get to the reality of the intention. The only way you can really see it is looking in the present moment. So don't think of this 
process here of staying with the breath and finding yourself wandering off and bringing the mind back to the breath as getting in the way of progress or getting in the way of where you want to go. Because if you see it simply as getting in the way, you're going to overlook it and try to push through. If you see that this is the spot where the awakening is going to happen, where the understanding is going to happen, and through the process of watching the breath, catching the mind as it wanders off, bringing it back, that's where all the insights are going to arise. In other words, it's not something that you want to push your way through or get out of the way. It's something you really want to look into. Because the Buddha had an amazing insight. You may have heard the story that after the night of his awakening, he spent 49 days experiencing the bliss of release. Not only that, but there's an awful lot of stuff that he learned in the course of those 49 days. You know the story when he was in the forest of simsapa trees. Simsapa trees, it turns out, have these little tiny, tiny leaves about the size of a dime. He scooped up a handful of them. They were on the forest floor. He asked the monks, which is more? The leaves in my hand or the leaves in the forest? The monks said, of course, it's the leaves in your forest are much more than the leaves in your hand. And the Buddha said in the same way that what I learned in the course of my awakening is like the leaves in the forest. What I brought out to teach is like the leaves in my hand. And he focused there on the Four Noble Truths as being the leaves in his hand. But other spots where he talks about the basic insight that he gained in his awakening, he boiled it down even further. It's a simple principle of causality. When you think of all the amazing things he could have talked about, it's interesting that this was the one he found most worthwhile to bring out and teach. Basically that our experience is based on two kinds of causal patterns. One is when X arises, Y is going to arise. When X passes away, Y is going to pass away. In other words, these things come and go together. It's causality right in the present moment. Another one is from the arising of X comes the arising of Y. From the passing away of X comes the passing away of Y. That doesn't have to be in the present moment. That can be over time. And if you think about it, what that means is any moment you experience is a combination of three things. A cause arising in the present plus the effects of that cause and effects coming in from the past. And what is that cause, and what are the effects in the past coming from? Well, they come from intentions. This means we have free will. At any moment we can choose what to focus on, what to do, what to say, what to think. We're not compelled by the past. There are influences coming in from the past, but we can choose which influences we're going to work on, which ones we're going to pick up, what we're going to do with them. That's what the whole pattern. That's what the whole fabric of this experience we have here in time and space. That's what it comes from. There's this constant new input coming from intention. And the Buddha's insight was, well, if you look at where the new input is coming from, maybe that will get you out. And where you're going to see that new input? Well, it's right here. It's the intentions in the present moment. You really want to get to know these well. And the best way to get to know your intentions is to set up one intention and see how long you can keep it going and see what other intentions are going to come in and try to change it. And then learn what skills you need in order to maintain that original intention, as long as it's a good one. Here the intention is to stay with the breath. to think about the breath, to evaluate the breath, to make it more comfortable so you can stay here longer, to give more support to your original intention.
And as you get more and more sensitive to the breath, you find that you also get more and more insensitive to those intentions. Those are the real causal factors in your life. What's a little bit dismaying about them is, especially in the beginning of the practice, to see how random they are. This little intention fires off, goes in one direction, then another one comes and goes in the exact opposite direction, or another one that comes from all over the place. But you don't let yourself get discouraged. Just learn the skills you need in order to focus on a skillful intention and stay there in the midst of all this randomness. The randomness helps remind you how artificial your storyline is. The storyline has to have a clean trajectory, and it may have a few setbacks here and there to make it an interesting story, but eventually there's one overall trajectory. It's like the basic shape of a melody. It may be an arc, it may be a valley between two peaks, and the individual notes may play around with that, go outside of the basic arc, but there's that basic arc that we see. That's what makes the melody satisfying. And so we're creating a narrative out of our lives. We're trying to s string together only the intentions that seem to make sense, that seem to fit into a basic shape. But look at what you've got here. Intentions going all over the place. That's a really important insight right there. Even though it's just the intention that comes in the insight that comes from seeing how unconcentrated your mind is. It's a valuable insight. If you take it to heart, it'll help deconstruct any narratives that are getting in the way of your practice. And that way you find it easier to settle down, just that much less distraction to deal with. So you find that when you can let go of the narratives, there's really a lot here to discover. Whether the meditation goes well or not, whether it goes in line with your expectations or not, that is another narrative. The important thing is that you really look at what's right here, right, right now, in particular in relationship to your intentions, the intention to stay with the breath. And whoops, there's another intention going off someplace else. Well, bring it back to the breath. You learn something about the mind right there. The act of bringing it back strengthens your original intention, strengthens your resolve. And the fact that you're able to catch the mind as it's wandering off strengthens your alertness, strengthens your mindfulness. So whether it's happening at the rate you would like to see happen in your ideal narrative, that's not the issue. The fact is that you're looking and you're learning. Sometimes you may have more lessons to learn than you had originally thought. But if you don't start from where you are, where are you going to start? And if the picture of what your mind is doing in the present moment doesn't fit into your ideal narrative, maybe it's time to question the narrative and not get impatient with the present moment. Because what is impatience? This is, impatience is the th part that m makes us judgmental. I mean, we need our powers of judgment. What turns powers of judgment, being judicious, into being judgmental is we get impatient. We want to come to a decision really fast before all the all the votes are in. And as a result, the, the judgment is useless. It becomes one more obstacle in 
in the way of seeing things as they actually are. So give the present moment some space. Don't push it so hard, thinking that you've got to get this result or that result in this or that amount of time. Really look at what's going on here without impatience, without the narrative that gives the push to impatience. And it's then that you're really going to see what's interesting. Because a spot where intention enters into the, that causal pattern, the route by which it enters in is also the route by which you're going to get out. So it's right here. It's not in the past, it's not in the future, it's right here. So allow yourself to settle down right here, and that way you'll get to see it, and know it, and follow it to release.